Welcome, everybody, to episode 78 of the Miami Tech Pod. We've got a great episode today. We've got uh, a full house today. We've got Maria, Will, and our special guest today, Mags, a.k.a. Magdalena Cara, um, from Double Down. And so we're going to dive into uh, what brought Mags to Miami, what she's doing next with her interesting new venture. And uh, we've got a lot of exciting things ahead for us. Um, so welcome to the show, Max. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about you, like who, who is Max and what should people who've never, who don't follow you on the myriad of social, uh, networks and have never heard of you, what, what should they know up front? Uh, Max is the queen of hot takes, uh, and that's pretty much all you ever need to know. <laughs> I'm uh, originally from Poland, uh, very little respect for authority. And I think that's actually one of the many ways that got me to crypto because it felt like one of the things that embraced the uh, questioning of the status quo. And that was kind of always my vibe. That's how I first came to the U.S. I decided I wanted to study in, a, in, in, in the United States and cold emailed every boarding school in America asking for a scholarship. And uh, of the over 200 emails, one school said yes. And, and I moved over here at 16 and never left. Um, and uh, I'm a career investor. I've been a, con a consumer investor my, my uh, entire career. I fell in love with consumer behavior and kind of why people do what they do and buy what they buy and kind of the consumer psychology of everything. And that's kind of the common thread of everything I've done. Um, and, uh, and now I am uh, launching this uh, fund called, called Double Down. It's a uh, fund investing in the mainstream adoption of Web3. I believe that the mainstream adoption of Web3 will happen through consumer culture. Um, and that's kind of where my background comes into play. I think Web3 is amazing in aligning incentives, so kind of that consumer psychology angle. Um, I think a lot about how consumer behaviors change and shift, but also don't change. And they stay very stable, actually, for decades and centuries. And so what does that mean for a future of new technologies uh, and the kind of Web3 overall? And then I've done a lot of branding and marketing, go-to-market strategy. And so I love um, that aspect of company building. And I realized that there was a big gap in the kind of Web3 universe of investors uh, who are not necessarily talking about those topics. And, and uh, so I'm doing it. I am uh, bringing my consumer expertise and go-to-market expertise and launching Double Down. Yeah, and I'm I'm very fortunate to say that Mags and I are partnered up. Mags has invested through Double Down in Cryptoys and on-chain studios that we're building. And 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 Mags, I have to give you props and and just for our listeners that they're learning about Mags for the first time, you know, Mags, in my opinion, is one of the sharpest, most brilliant minds in the space when it comes to consumer investing and like she said, the intersection of Web3 and consumer. There is a short list of shareholders uh, and investors that I have on the cap table that like I go to when like I have like a, you know, something that's like really bothering me or something that I really want somebody's opinion on or like, you know, like just a product angle or a different point of view and Mags is on that short list. Like, you know, whenever there's, especially like when it comes to like product positioning or marketing or just the way we talk about it, Mags is usually one of the first people I go to. So really fortunate just to be, you know, working with you Mags and I'm, I'm, I'm super bullish on, on, on you and double down and, uh, it's awesome that you chose Miami as basically the HQ uh, for Double Down. So would love to get into that, this being the Miami Tech Pod. What gravitated you towards Miami and, and uh, tell us more about it? For sure. Well, first, I will say that you're bullish on me. I'm bullish on you. And our future fates are very linked together. So I love that. <laughs> yeah, better as do far, a good job. Yeah, as far as Miami goes. Um, so it's interesting because I first moved here uh, in the uh, end of 2021. And uh, it was actually mostly for the general energy. I saw the excitement. I saw the energy. I wasn't even thinking about it through the Web3 lens. It was a very basic, I've been in Boston for a really long time. I've done enough Boston winters. And, uh, you know, is the time to move somewhere where I feel the optimism and excitement. And that was it. And then when I got here, I realized that um, a few things I completely didn't think about that make me so happy living in Miami. 
So one is obviously um, kind of the Web3 energy specifically. It's not just kind of the general excitement. Um, it's very core Web3 community. A lot of NFT collectors and builders. But overall, I think Miami has this very uh, Web3 native culture. And there's a reason why all of the biggest conferences happen here and, and uh, people are constantly coming by town. So I love that about it. Um, I also feel like the combination of the you know, Latin impact on the culture, a lot of newcomers, the optimism around Miami as a tech city overall adapt to a very welcoming community. I, uh, I, it's hard to move into a new city, right? And feel here, I feel like I came in, met a lot of great people who were very excited to introduce me to other new people and having that community right off the bat of people that I'm excited about and who kind of are interested in the same things. It's so special. On that note, can you trace back to how you and Will met? I'm curious. Do you remember um, how you first met? Will has DM'd me on Twitter. I'm pretty sure that's how we first met. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so Mags, I, I, it's traces back. First of all, I've been following Mags for a long time. She's always been a great, great Twitter follow. And and for, for those of you that are listening that uh, that don't follow Mags, that's your call to action immediately after this podcast. Make sure you follow Mags on Twitter. We'll drop her or link to her Twitter account in the in the description and the show notes. But always have followed Mags on Twitter, just always respect and appreciate her point of view. Um, and you were still at your previous job at the time. I remember during COVID, Mags announced on Twitter that she was taking a step back and trying to figure out what's next for her. Uh, and I selfishly DM'd Mags, I believe, around that time to try to maybe recruit her to work with Cryptoys in some way because she was such a, a sharp consumer investor. Um, I, it, it, uh, again, I, Twitter is a shit show when it comes to DMs, so I don't fault anybody if it gets lost in the, in, in, in especially if you're not following the other person. I don't think Mags was following me at the time, and that's totally okay. I understand, and it goes into like the, 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 the other tab which never even gets looked at. But my you know, Twitter is a dumpster fire, exactly. so yes, I yeah, apologize. Yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> so I tried DMing Mags. I think it was right in the middle of the the pandemic, and then you know she she moved to Miami, and I think that, the, again what Mags is talking about, just like the 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 the, the, the circle of Miami and how close knit it is, especially when it comes to like Web three, you really can kind of find your tribe rather quickly, and uh, you know Mags and I connected again. I, I think we DM'd each other again, and then got on a call and. And Mags, you know, again, the thesis that you're talking about with Double Down, where the, the really the mainstream onboarding ramp for Web3 and blockchain will be through consumer products, uh, is, is obviously deeply aligned with what we're doing at Crypto. So, like, I mean, if I had to to literally create a list of the investors that I want on my cap table, like Mags, again, she she was in the top five. So it was so stoked that she joined and uh, and invested after all. Mags, I'm kind of curious, what do you think? is going to be sort of the dominant interface or um, UX of Web3 in five years? Okay, so first hot take here is that I don't think UX as matters as much as people think. And it matters. It can't be like a huge problem. But um, two examples I point to. One, Axie Infinity was actually a horrible onboarding experience, but like 70 year olds in the Philippines didn't care and figure it out because they had some motivation to do it, right? And so if you give people reasons to care, uh, whatever they are, whether it's a thing they're passionate about or money making or a community or whatever it is, if you give them reasons to care, people will jump through the hoops, right? And then I think the other side of that is People don't onboard to things just because the UX is great. I, for that, I use the example of Zoom. Your 80-year-old grandma was not using Zoom before the pandemic because she didn't have a use case for it. It didn't matter. There was like a super easy software and anyone can use it. There was no need to use it. So she did it, right? And then pandemic hits, there is a use case. It helps that the UX is very clean and easy and everyone is using it. But like that wasn't the reason why. The reason why was the specific thing that that person cares about and this technology now enables them to do. And so when I think of Web3 and adoption uh, and, and how I think about on-ramps, like on-ramps are things that people care about that like grab their attention because if you give people things that they care about, they're going to jump through hoops. And then what is actually going to be the dominant um, UX? Like who the hell knows? But I think the, the kind of the underlying thing is 
it's going to be baked in a lot of products where you're not even going to notice. I do think that um, there is some chance that we're going to have the equivalent of like a e-commerce checkout, you know, when you're buying something on Shopify and there's like, here's like 10 different uh, um, payment options that you can have. We're probably going to have some version of that with like, here's like 10 different wallets and a bunch of the big tech companies are going to have their own wallets, like entirely possible that that's the case too, right? Like, I think there's a lot of different theories why it might go one way or the other, but at the end of the day, none of the UX choices are going to matter if there isn't an underlying utility that people care about. I totally agree with that. And I think two, two great examples, Max, let me know if you agree, is like what Reddit did with their digital collectibles and then also the Starbucks announcement. I think these are two very consumer focused approaches to, you know, onboarding, you know, for NFTs and blockchain assets. So like with uh, Reddit, you know, that made a lot of sense to me because it takes a, a community of users that already exist, right? They're already Reddit users, Web2 users that signed up with a username and password. It made sense for the use case. It was like a native use case of avatars. Sure, Reddit needs avatars and there's a certain kind of subset of people that care about that stuff. And you were able to create a vault, which was effectively your wallet, but was branded as a vault. And you could transact it with a credit card. And they didn't even talk about that it was NFTs. It was just like, digital avatar collecting for that specific platform. Starbucks, and I've heard you make this example before, we did a, a workshop with Michelle Abs uh, a few weeks ago for EO, and you were talking about like the Starbucks use case and you know why that's so bullish for the space. You know, with, with Reddit, it's, it's Polygon, but nobody knows it's Polygon, right? And with Starbucks, I actually believe it's Polygon also, but nobody's going to know it's Polygon. They're just going to think they're trading stamps in their odyssey passport right so do you think those are two examples of where it's going with mass adoption of nfts for sure and i think it's one of those things where um i think a lot of people in web3 that are discounting how much of a role these large existing companies are going to have right it's that classic justin can quote uh first time founders care about the product and second time founders care about distribution like at the end of the day there is a lot of tech companies not all of them are innovative, not all of them are want to take risks, but there's enough like large companies with massive user bases that if they do something interesting, they're going to get crazy adoption. And I think those are like two excellent examples of that. I think what's going to be interesting with the Starbucks example is that it's actually a separate experience, right? Um, and so it's going to be a subset of the uh overall starbucks kind of rewards programs user base that will onboard to that it's not going to be kind of fully converted if you will uh and i'm curious how that's going to go uh because one of my kind of general mental models around opportunities in web3 is that i think super fans are super underserved and that plays out in a lot of different categories. I think it plays out in music. I think it plays out in sports. I think it plays out in media. And then I think Starbucks is actually a good example of a brand that does pretty good job with serving its general fan base, user base. But if you're like a Starbucks super fan, there are very limited points of engagement that you can have. And these types of programs, programs around tokenized loyalty actually best serve the super fans. Uh, while also, you know, having an interesting utility for everyone else. So I'm curious to see like how that unfolds. Uh, but I've generally been impressed with how those two companies have handled it. And again, it's a massive distribution scale and companies that have always been at the forefront of some interesting technological trends. I mean, I think that you, you touched on some interesting points there. I think this is also a drastically, drastically different approach than like the first gen of web three and nfts and stuff like that the big brands tried to sort of like sort of uh money grab around right like taco bell with their stupid nfts or any of these other big brands you know like even adidas had a bunch of stupid shitty nfts in the beginning you know it's like oh and i think we're as a community beyond that point of like oh the only utility of my of this nft is that i get to buy more stuff from you like get the fuck out of here like you know <laughs> give me something real or give me reward me for my loyalty you know or whatever it is you know and i think i think brands are starting to understand that and there was the first wave of every single uh like web n numerical is people like agencies and individuals charging big brands a ton of money for useless crap that gets thrown away, right? I was guilty of this 
when Web 2.0 started. I used to charge brands tons of money for stupid Facebook pages and Facebook apps and things like that. Um, and all of it got thrown away because it was all useless. But it was like, oh, they didn't want to miss the hype cycle, right? And so I think... I think Wait, we, Brian, didn't we meet because I hired you to create a Facebook page? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now, you, now he's admitting to you that it was useless. <laughs> it was well, great. I think Maria I knew that it was... All along. I feel like Maria knew that it was useless once they mothballed it like three weeks after we launched <laughs> it, right? And so uh, if it was truly something they planned to invest in long term, they would still be paying maintenance fees 20, 12 years later or whatever it was. Um, no, but I, I think... I think the only difference is that this sort of window of time where we were in that sort of like, let's early experiment on, you know, sort of marketing fluff was compressed, right? In previous generations of the web, it was two, three years where people were doing all this stuff. Now it was like six months, right? You know, and so the time cycles are shortening and the uh, iterative cycles are shortening, I think, across the board here. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's one of those things where um, I view the world in general through the lens of incentives, right? Like why people do things. And when you think of why big brands jumped on the hype train of NFTs was because doing anything was getting your PR coverage, right? And so one, you could like make some money selling the the job, but more importantly, you earned so much in, in impressions. And so it was worth it um, to be like one of the first to do something, right? And then if you think of like companies are like, companies are not really making decisions as companies it's individuals making decisions at those companies and if you are a cmo who is being told your two peers have done something you need to do something too your only like only thing you can do is actually launch something whether you believe in it or not right and like that's those were the incentives that was the dominant strategy if you were going to be smart that's what you did and now that has played out because things are moving faster and faster and faster but I am actually very impressed with how many big companies and corporates are still actually going ahead with their Web3 programs and their Web3 projects, right? There was this big joke that when market collapse, like, okay, everyone is just like scrapping everything. If things are getting launched because they already got developed in the bull market, so might as well. But like, we've been kind of in a down market for a few months now and people are moving like ahead and people are starting new things and they're brainstorming and they're thinking through what is the best use of the technology for their business. And that to me is a huge bull signal um, as far as Web3 goes, because if like, if that's happening, once the market turns, like the future is bright. All right, Max, as queen of the hot takes, what are some of the hottest takes you've had or and or ones that have gotten you in the most trouble? <laughs> I keep getting in trouble all the time. I can. I can. That, this about... is Maria's way of saying, "Max, cancel yourself." It's just a... <laughs> <I> mean... <laughs> okay. So one, I would say, um, I I don't know if those are hot takes or not hot takes, but I will go with a few. One, I think the the word utility is overused and overrated, but also how we think about utility is kind of wrong. Um, no one ever asks what is the utility of going to the NBA game, right? Like that, like it's, you would never ask that. And but like, what is the utility of going to an NBA game? Like it's the experience. It's like you being there and being part of something. And then we have all these NFT products. We're like, oh, what is the utility? We're like, oh no, the experience is part of the utility. And so I think the, there has obviously been a lot of like projects and drops that have no value whatsoever. And there were quick cash grabs and rack pulls and whatnot. But I think there's a little bit of this uh, misperception of like what utility is, what utility should be, and like what actually gives value to a project. So that's one. Um, I definitely think about um, how when we have new technology, a lot of times people are just trying to have everything be new, new, new. And the reality is that pretty much every innovation draws on some human behavior that has been the case for like decades, if not centuries, right? And so like here, like the reason why NBA Top Shot has blown up because it's basically a combination of like card collecting and sports betting. Like it's not rocket science. New technology makes it better for X, Y, and Z reasons, but it is actually a very fundamental dynamic. And so a lot of times I feel like people are trying to over innovate without thinking of like why people do what they do and like care about what they care about. Um, and I think I see that in particular in Web3 with builders who 
are not being very thoughtful about the industries that they're trying to disrupt, right? If you're thinking, um, I think of my thesis, it's intersection of Web3 with a lot of different areas of consumer economy, whether it's like fashion, music, gaming, sports, media, whatever. And I think a lot of builders are not being very thoughtful about which parts of those sectors you should disrupt because they're inefficient and can be better now with a new uh, with Web3. They're you know, overdue for kind of technology refresh and whatnot. And then which parts of those sectors are what they are for a reason. And there's like a structural reason why that is the case. And you probably shouldn't disrupt it, you know? Um, I think it's a, the, the good example is music, right? Record labels, we can complain a lot about record labels uh, and how inefficient they are. But like there is real value that record labels have provided to musicians, which is why some of the biggest music, musical arts in existence all have record label deals. They don't have to for their new albums, but they choose to because there's a lot of value being provided, right? And so I think from that, uh, that's another hot take where um, I think not all industry structures need to be disrupted. And some, you have to be very thoughtful about which parts to disrupt and which parts to like play nice with because there is a reason why they're there. That's a great transition, Max, into talking a little bit more about Double Down. And I know you, you're making a big announcement this week, right, about the fund. And we would love to hand it off to you to kind of share about what that is. But I'm curious to get your point of view and also for our listeners that, that are either listening or watching. What do you look for when you're evaluating a company and an opportunity and a founder through the Double Down lens? So as I said, like the thesis, mainstream adoption of Web3, I need to see reasons why the general population is going to care about the startup. And it's not like a general population overall, but based on your target customer, why should people care? And will it have a chance of getting that widespread adoption of people who are not onboarded to crypto today? Um, and then that's, that's, that's the thesis. If it's not mainstream adoption, I don't want it. And I do believe that a lot of that mainstream adoption is going to happen through these points of passion, points of interest that people already have. Um, there's this very interesting theory that basically all consumers are torn between neophilia, like curiosity about the new, and then neophobia, like fear of something too new, right? And I think with crypto, we kind of have a lot of neophobia. Uh, it's too new, it's too different, and there's a lot of perceptions around it. And so you have to attach it to, to something familiar, because essentially what that theory says, if you're selling something that's very new, you have to sell it in a familiar way. If you're selling something very familiar, you have to sell it in an exciting way. Like That's basically the balance. And so I think in crypto, um, the way to get adoption is to sell it, um, if you will, through attachment to passion points that people already have, the areas that they already care about. Um, as far as like what I'm looking for beyond this kind of mainstream orientation, um, I team is the number one thing, right? And to me, the team thing is... Um, Web3 authenticity and kind of understanding of the technology and being very deep into why this is a Web3 product and, and why does it like matter to be built the way that it's being built. I think too, though, it's experience scaling companies overall. I love Rebeat Founders. That's why I love you, Will, because you know what it takes to build an organization. You know what, the build, what it takes to build for scale. And right now we're in this funny phase where a lot of these companies and projects have like what? 5,000 users, 10,000 users, that is not exactly a mainstream scale. And it will be a lot of heavy lifting to get them to a, kind of what is a reasonable user base. And that is a very unique skill set that like a lot of people don't have. Um, and then the kind of ties to the last bit, which is the distribution. Like, are you being thoughtful about how you're going to sell this thing? And that's what the part that I love to geek out about and work with founders on, right? Like how you think about who is your target customer? Where do you find them? How do you storytell to them? Like what is, should be your like go-to-market strategy around like all those, those points. Um, and then if they're kind of thoughtful and care about that and interested in exploring that, like that to me is a good signal because distribution is everything at the end of the day. Um, so that's kind of the general high level points. It's a early stage fund. I'll be primarily doing seed stage investments, uh, but we'll always do some pre-seed, series A, maybe even series B. If I see an opportunity for a kind of a great outcome and a great journey, like I will still want to invest in those companies. Uh, and then writing checks between kind of 200 and 500 K and uh, hoping to bring the, the Web3 mainstream adoption. So how should people kind of give their pitch to you? So actually on my fund website, I have a uh, intake form. So 
I do believe in the one of the big values of Web3 is a room of our gatekeepers. And I think the warm intro gatekeeping is not great. Um, and so I want to be as approachable as possible. We already established that my Twitter DMs are a dumpster fire. So <laughs> there is a, there is an intake form on the website for people to kind of drop what they're working on um, and then for me to get back to them. So it's a, a double-down.com. I am hope we can just drop it in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. We'll do that. And something you mentioned uh, reminded me of something is kind of making something more familiar. And I feel like we haven't talked about it on the podcast since the news has gone about Will and OnChain's partnership with Mattel and, and kind of Masters of the Universe. And I just it just immediately came to mind when you said that. So, um, Will, do you want to share a little bit for the people living under a rock that didn't see this? The, the Mattel partnership? Yeah. Oh, sure. So, yeah, we, we partnered with Mattel. Uh, we did a multi-year partnership, uh, you know, with Mattel, again, one of the biggest toy companies in the world, iconic company. Uh, what's great about that partnership is at the surface, it looks like a traditional licensing deal where we're licensing their IP and bringing them to, to our platform. But it goes beyond that because they're actually investors uh, in the Series A. They actually invested alongside Mags in, in the same round. Uh, so we're really, really excited about that. So they're actual shareholders in the company. So there's truly aligned incentives there. Uh, and they've been fantastic. So the first line of toys that we're doing with them is Master the Universe, uh, one of the most iconic toy lines of all time. Can't tell you what the next line is because we're building a lot of marketing and excitement around it. Uh, so if that's coming soon, we'll make that announcement pretty shortly. But I think people will, will, can connect the dots uh, on some of the things that we'll be tweeting out shortly. Uh, and that partnership is, is absolutely amazing. And that's one where I, I, I did lean on uh, Mags quite a bit as that deal was uh, being negotiated. And, and I, on many conversations, she helped me think through that and what we could possibly get from them. So another example of how Mags is, uh, is adding value. And I just want to say to um, to folks that are listening, again, if you're at the intersection of consumer and blockchain, you need Mags on your cap table. I look at I, I, for, First of all, like, Make sure you reach out to Max, but I don't care if, like, if you're one of those founders that have like a hot round and people are, you make allocation for Max. Okay. It's well, she's one of those people. Like I've, 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 there's very few investors that roll up their sleeves and give you the time and thoughtfulness as much as Max does and can really help you from a consumer perspective like Max does. And again, like marketing is a big thing in web three, Max, we talk about this a lot. Like there's not a lot of like marketing when it comes to like like really thoughtful marketing approaches when it comes to web three in the traditional consumer sense. And I think this is a great segue because Mags, you actually spend a great deal of time educating web two marketers how to make the jump into web three. You actually have a program, right? An organized program. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that so folks can can learn more. For sure. So uh, the program is called Meta Curious Marketing. Um, and it started actually with kind of two parts. One, talking with founders like Will and realizing that like the marketing talent that was kind of sufficiently familiar with Web3 was very scarce. And I do think that one of the biggest barriers to adoption is actually because we don't have great marketing talent. So like the, the gap there of we need more traditional marketers to jump into this space, especially as I saw over and over and again, people reinventing the wheel, right? Like over the last decade plus of Instagram, we learned how Insta like influencer marketing should work. And somehow the entire Web3 space is just like learning from scratch how to work with influencers. It makes no sense. And so I feel like we could supercharge the space by bringing more traditional marketing talent for brand building, from inf for influencer marketing, for uh, content marketing, all of those interesting topics um, to, to, to help scale. And then uh, I was also talking to a bunch of marketers in the space already who felt like they didn't ha necessarily have a space to like jam and talk about ideas. And so um, Meta Curious Marketing was born. Uh, we're just finalizing the second cohort. So it's it's kind of crazy that we've now gone through um, kind of uh, almost 100 marketers in the program. Um, mix of people who are kind of interested in Web3 but working very traditional jobs and people who are already a little bit in Web3 um, have roles in the space and are just looking for a peer group to talk about these ideas because the playbook doesn't exist. I think there is a lot of interesting things to be borrowed from traditional marketing, but there's also so many things that have to be adapted for a Web3 world. Like analytics are completely different. You can't really do an, a kind of attribution modeling. You can't really do much in terms of like paid social right now, for example, but like 
And there's other areas like brand building, like influencer marketing, like um, kind of thoughtful brand building through events and partnerships and whatnot that are very kind of traditional marketing skills. And so we're just trying to bridge that gap, getting people into the space, talking about what works, what doesn't work. And, and uh, we've done the program in partnership with some amazing guest speakers, kind of leaders of the industry. I had Whitney Steele, who's uh, running marketing for OpenSea, um, speak to the cohort. Avery Akinani from Vayner3 speak to the cohort. Raihan from FWB, just a lot of great builders at the forefront of things and talking about some of these topics um, and everything from kind of day-to-day -day and, and brand building all the way to how do you do crisis comes? Because in Web3, more so than any other uh, industry right now, things go wrong all the time. And so how do you communicate that, especially when you have a passionate community? Because the one of the side effects of having a passionate community is that you have people who really care and who are going to be on your ass if things go wrong. And so like, how do you manage that? And so I think there's just like this very interesting field of opportunity and the more great marketers we can get into this space, um, who kind of combine the Web3 and marketing, the better the entire space is going to be. You know, it's interesting, the, the community aspect of all this stuff. Um, I think it's also it causes a drastic shift in the sort of fundamental operating economics of any uh, project now, right? Because like you're building this community, you rely on the community to buy your, your tokens, your NFTs, whatever it is, right? And then one of the assets you provide them is this community. But then a lot of times people forget that it costs a lot of money long-term to like manage and support and grow a healthy community, you know? And so like uh, someone made an interesting example. It was like, this is a, a shift back from like SaaS product pricing, right? Where SaaS, you sort of had this drip of income coming throughout, whereas NFTs and a lot of these other projects, you're going backwards towards you know, upfront software pricing and stuff like that. And I think figuring out or teaching this latest generation of uh, entrepreneurs how to model their costs and, and build the economics alongside the uh, and into the fundamentals of whatever it is they're doing, their community and all that stuff is going to be interesting. Because I think we're going to see a lot of people who either you know, uh, raise a bunch of money from their initial thing or raise a bunch of VC funds for their project and then don't realize that, you know, what the long-term sustainability of all this is. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Although I would say that a lot of founders are also thinking through that lens too of like, how can I have repeatable revenue, mm -hmm. right? And that's why you have a lot of projects that are doing like season passes, for example, where like it's not a lifetime membership it's a seasonal membership because that way you get a kind of above recurring revenue but also like more flexibility for someone right like theoretically if you think like pure strategy perspective upfront pricing for something for a lifetime membership should always be higher than a monthly or annual or whatever and therefore you're actually in decreasing the barrier to entry if you do it on a seasonal pass with a lower price point, right? And you allow people to check it out. I think one of the other things that you see with communities, and it's a topic I think about a lot, is how do you thoughtfully scale a community? Because a lot of communities actually derive value not from being a community, but from being exclusive. And scaling exclusivity is really hard. There's plenty of companies that have done it. I mean, hello, luxury industry or, you know, Supreme or whatever. Like there is a lot of examples where people have managed to scale exclusivity. But if that's the only value of the community, it's not going to go anywhere at the end of the day. Um, and that's like definitely like one aspect to it. And then the other thing, like as you scale a community, it evolves, it changes. And that can be really hard for you know, project leaders and the kind of company leadership. Um, but like you can't be a slave to your community. I think there are a lot of times communities are actually holding projects hostage because companies are so scared of upsetting that core. And like you should very much listen to your core. They're your early adopters. They're your super fans. They're your users. People who actually hang out in discords and leave thoughtful comments and leave criticism, like they are your super users. You should be utilizing them, right? But at the end of the day, if you're going to be only serving those super users, you're never going to scale. And so that thoughtful balance between how do you stay authentic to the core, reward your early supporters, um, and then kind of make them feel valued part of this journey because they very much be on the journey from day one, but at the same time, don't be hostage to it to them and actually scale and be able to expand 
by you know and provide value to everyone those early adopters included Max, I want to switch a little bit to some current event stuff to get your your thoughts on it. And My hot takes, you, more hot takes. Your hot takes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the queen of hot takes, and I'm curious because you're such a a, a frequent Twitter user, uh, and you put so much content on 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 Twitter, some great stuff. To think about the way Twitter has shaped up, it's become obviously the the pulse of Web three. You know, it's it's basically the, the digital town square for Web three. It's digital town square for a lot of different things, but there's a lot of problems on Twitter bots, whatnot. And obviously, Elon just acquired it. There was a lot of talk during the acquisition process on if Twitter should. And Jack Dorsey, I think, even made some tweets about this that Twitter should be a decentralized platform. Uh, it should be a protocol. It should just be technology, but it shouldn't be a centralized profit making company or entity. Uh, Fred Wilson, I think, you know, one of the early founders, uh, investors in Twitter tweeted out a similar sentiment to back up Dorsey. What are your thoughts on Twitter, the evolution of it, uh, it during this whole transition with Elon now taking it over? What do you think about the future of Twitter? Uh, that's a big question. And yeah. I obviously big fan of Twitter. A lot yeah. of investments, all of my investors have come through Twitter relationships, etc. cetera. Um, so I, when I think about it through that lens, right, it's highly valuable service that yeah. is clearly not extracting as much value from me as it's providing to me. So if I think of like that economic exchange, right, like Twitter's biggest problem as a business is actually it provides so much more value than it takes. Um, and it's, it's especially for the super fans, which again, Very the true. super fans uh, are always an interesting kind of customer segment for any service or product. Um, Twitter by far, by the way, I have to say is the most valuable social network by far far in my life i think it's most probably the most additive social network everything else is like a time suck twitter's a time suck too but it's given me a lot you know yes. in life so i mean will if you just agreed to do those tiktoks with me that i've been asking you to do <laughs> that we'd be changing that uh calculus hey, i I'm thought you were going to on say my... only fans but okay <laughs> i'm working i got i will got lizzo on only queued fans. up i got lizzo queued up and i'll do practices and you and me can can get in there hey i've been on the tiktok for crypto is beat for a long time oh, now you have so. been, no, you have been. <laughs> but right. uh, but as far as twitter goes right it's like it's actually if uh if i think of like the platform like it provides me a lot more value than it charges me for which um, or like, uh, you know, what could be charging me for. At the same right. time, like I recognize that it is very much a utility, right? And uh, anytime you have something that's so important to so many people, not just kind of from this business or network or whatever perspective, but also if you think so many countries where that becomes the fact, the channel for news and, and, and everything like right. that, like there is an argument why that should be decentralized and kind of outside of the control of any government or kind of singular um, for profit entity. Um, I think we have, with Twitter right now, what has been fascinating to me is a little bit of this, um, this contrast where on the one hand, the whole situation of, and, and people who are upset about Elon taking over and making a bunch of changes and singularly deciding what's going to happen, right? Like, we'll, Trump be allowed to be back on right. the platform? Will like this content moderation versus that content moderation policy be in place? A lot of people are very upset about this one person making decisions. Well, hello, mm -hmm. that's literally the value of Web3 that you're going to have co-governance, co-ownership, so you're not at mercy of whoever is in charge, right? Um, at the same time, crypto Twitter generally has kind of welcomed Elon as the new overlord of, yes. of Twitter, yeah. right? Because they think he will embody the spirit of Web3 in removing the censorship and this and that, whatever. And therefore, he is a better dictator than the previous dictator, because at the end of the day, company leadership that is not allowed, like elected by anyone is a dictatorship, right? <laughs> and so like that's, that's been a funny thing to me where... The people most complaining should be actually embracing the spirit of Web3. People in Web3 are actually very excited about it on the on the uh, most part. And I think we'll, we'll see what happens uh, and then kind of how meaningful the changes are going to be. Um, I will be watching it very carefully. And I am thinking about it a lot, given how much of my business yeah. gets conducted through Twitter. But like how much of that is really like um, this like meme, YOLO, 
like fuck it mentality that we've got in the NFT world and Web3 world and Twitter and all this stuff, right? Like so much of the activity in the last two years, financial stuff like Wall Street Bets and all these other things that were like intertwined with Twitter community, intertwined with Web3 culture and all this stuff had this sort of like, fuck it, throw anything against the wall, see what happens. You know, who cares what the repercussions might be? You know, ha ha, Elon is funny. So we think that he's cool. Like, and we're, we like the chaos of it, right? Like, and sort of the, no one is controlling, no one is driving this car as it goes off a cliff mentality, right? And so like how much of that, uh, like the support in this bubble that we're all in of, you know, tech, whatever, is that right versus like anyone sitting, uh, sitting there thoughtfully thinking well this mega billionaire is really going to do what's best for all of us individually right like he doesn't give i think i think the interesting thing with elon though is, is still and, and mag's hit on this uh, is like he feels i think in perception at least to the most of like twitter as one of us because he's an active Twitter user and he's he's doing memes and he's joking around on the platform. So and he's, he's been more, suspended more, before. He's been, he's, <laughs> he trolls he's people. More, <laughs> right. He's more relatable in that sense. And I think at, at, because he, it's almost like, wow, an active user is actually becoming the owner of the company. And if you're an active user like we are, it's like, okay, I trust an active user to make better product decisions than somebody in a boardroom that might not be as active, right? But I also think Brian has a point in that at the end of the day, everything is segmentation, right? Everything is right. segmentation and you have sure. some portion of the users who are there for Will's reasons and supporting him for Will's reasons. Some people who are supporting him for Brian's reasons. Some people who like actually think that he is an incredible builder and entrepreneur. And so maybe he can shake things up from that perspective because he actually does, you know, daring product choices and brings talent into organizations and this and that. So like there's, I think a lot of different people are supporting who are active users are supporting him for different reasons. Um, and kind of we'll see, we'll see what happens overall. I think we're we're all rooting for the success because we want Twitter to work and we want Twitter to be a great space that thrives. We need, I think Elon hit on this, like humanity needs a digital town square where everyone feels safe and everybody can share ideas in a, in a safe way. So. so, I mean, I think, look, I think, yes, we all want this to like work out for the best, right? And we all want this to, you know, but then like, I'll, I'll be honest, I have my reservations that this isn't going to turn into a cesspool of shit and vitriol in like two I weeks. I worry about it so much. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, I spent all this time investing into this community and building my brand and, and like making friends and all this stuff. And it's like, but there's nowhere else. Farcaster, like, it's time to onboard to Farcaster. <laughs> are you an investor in Farcaster? No, I'm not. Uh, it's one I of the companies I very it. much wish I was an investor in, though. I got to try it out. I, I keep seeing tweets about it. I keep seeing tweets about Farcaster, so that goes to show you. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. So I, I, clearly I'm not part of that segment of the bubble. It's like a decentralized Twitter is kind of the pitch, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, tw a Web3 native Twitter. Okay. Okay. Time to create a profile. <laughs> <laughs> um i guess so by the time this uh, this airs it'll have been like a week since uh elon bought twitter so we'll see we'll do a recap uh, like a mini recap in a couple of weeks if with you guys twitter's still there we'll tweet out the episode if not this will be found on <laughs> Arcast, instagram and tiktok <laughs> Email marketing, baby. We are actually going to be embracing another hot take for you. Web3 is going to actually embrace email marketing because it is still one of the greatest mm. ways of building a relationship yes. with users. I think 100%. we'll just have to do it in a very Web3 native way, not in the people are spamming me with random stuff five times a day because they are running a promo. But I think email is underutilized channel in building a relationship with people. And unlike phone numbers, like, people have bajillion email addresses and can have anonymous email addresses. And so I am a, I am actually long email in web three, as far as marketing um, goes. 100%. You know, it, it's interesting to me. There's been this rise of newsletters and, and like, and uh, email as the medium for content creators in the last year and a half, two years and people like making money in that channel. But it's, 
kind of strange because like blogging was there for years, right? And blogging is a more natural fit for this type of content creation because it's not ephemeral, right? And it has evergreen values and things like that. But like, it's weird that a lot of these content creators who shifted over to newsletters didn't bother just making a paywalled website. You know? Yeah, but the reality is most newsletters actually have the archive of content, and so it's both, right? Yeah, but you don't, they're not, but they're not searchable, right? Or they're not easily discoverable, right? So, like, the stuff that you wrote six months ago isn't going to be, like, stumbled upon by, you know, the Will Wine Robs of the World when they're searching for that, it, and so... Is this where I plug my new newsletter that I'm launching alongside my fund? Go, absolutely. <laughs> we expect at least two shills per 10 minutes of all our guests. And um, I mean, it comes with advisory shares that you owe us. No, I'm just <laughs> no but real talk. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot as far as this intersection of, you know, building in Web3 and the gap I see in kind of marketing, branding and go to market expertise. and I can only work with so many founders and I think that that kind of knowledge needs to be disseminated. And so I am launching a kind of go-to-market oriented newsletter for founders and builders in the space. Um, sign up is also on the uh, fund website and um, it's going to be probably bi-weekly. Um, I, but for now, just sign up. I will be launching that soon and um, all the archive will be living on the fund website as well. I'm hoping over time it grows into this interesting kind of Web3 marketing resource. Um, there will be a lot of content by me, a lot of case studies, a lot of guest posts from kind of active marketers and builders in the space as well with kind of their lessons learned. So all about marketing, branding, and go-to-market um, in the Web3 world. Amazing. Thank you, Mags, for coming on the show. I just want to say before we started recording, Mags said she was more excited to meet me than Brian, and I'm going to relish in that for the rest of the weekend. Um, but thank you so much. We're really excited to break the news about your new fund, and we hope you'll come on again sometime soon. Uh, and thanks for all the hot takes. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Queen of hot takes, always available. Find me on Twitter or another platform if Twitter goes to shit. <laughs> Amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Mags.